At the heart of our nation sits something so powerful and all pervasive that we don't even notice it's there. It's wonderful. How would we manage without it? How? And it is, it is totally magical where it come from. It shaped our politics, our landscape, our way of life. And building it would be one of Britain's greatest engineering achievements. There was the sense of pioneering. It was a great feeling, and the locals felt it was a great feeling. Barn, and here you are, here's electricity. From the fire stations, the current is fed into the great network of transmission lines commonly known as the grid. This electrical backbone of the country is a unique British achievement. This series is the story of our national electricity grid. Through its lattice, current can travel from power stations across the country and right into our lives. Oh, the Hoover's a great thing to you. That saves an awful lot of hard work because before that, it was just a shuffle and a hand brush. We've become more dependent on it than our grandparents could have ever imagined. If you like, as we go on, the grid becomes a mesh. It becomes finer and finer, and it, and it contours itself around our lives. And such is its importance that controlling the grid has delivered enormous power. The primary concern was to keep the lights on. Through its spark, modern Britain has been brought to life. And it's the grid that keeps it and us going. If you lose your electricity, you're pretty much dead in the water. Once upon a time, electricity was the preserve of vengeful gods with their bolts from the heavens. Humans must have been fascinated with electricity from the world go. Imagine early people looking up into a thunderstorm and watching a bolt of lightning flashing through the sky. Even now, today, we still use that sort of image of the lightning flashing down from the gods in the sky in films, in cartoons, there's Batman, Spider-Man. You always see these great flashes and bolts of electricity. So we still have this somehow deep inside us, there's a primitive feeling, electricity is the stuff of gods. Scientists, though, were quite determined to bring it down to Earth. And by the end of the 19th century, they'd invented generators, motors, and the electric light bulb. But in Britain in the 20s, these wonders were reserved for the curious, the lucky, or the frankly intrepid. My parents had a boot and shoe shop in the high street in Barry. And uh, so we had our own electricity long before there was any generally available. We actually generated our own. My father had a gas engine down in the cellar, which was used for shoe repairs. And there was a dynamo there. He could generate electricity to the rows of accumulators all along the walls. But the shop had an errand boy. And every time he tried to turn on the light, he got an electric shock. Why that was, I don't know. I'd have thought that we were probably about the only people in Barry to have electricity at the time. In large towns and cities, things were marginally more advanced. A hodgepodge of private companies and municipal councils sold electricity. And London offered the widest variety. Electricity distribution in London was a mess. You might have a house in one street which had one type of supply at one voltage, and then the, the house in the next street would be a completely different system. So if you moved house, you might have appliances that wouldn't work because you'd be on a completely different system and then you'd need to adapt them. In 1920, just 6% of British homes were connected. Electricity was yet to go mass market. It really was very difficult for most people to afford electricity. Just keeping five, five bulbs going for the day would cost you a week's wages of the average person. Across the Channel, the world was altogether brighter. Both France and Germany used almost twice as much electricity as we did in Britain. Much to the dismay of many on our own island. 
But why can't we instill some attractive lighting like this into our metropolis and make a brighter city to attract the great tourist stream? Countries like France and Germany had a, a much stronger state power um, saying you should do this. We didn't have anything like this here. The state stood aside and allowed private companies essentially to do what they liked. But unfortunately this uh, ignored what uh, economists now call market imperfections, one of which was scale, unless you could build up quickly to a scale uh, and, and to national standards that actually covered the whole country, uh, you would uh, be in a mess. The task of bringing Britain into the light fell to Conservative Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin, a man better known for his pipe smoking and his radical politics. Stanley Baldwin had a problem in thinking about this. He really did not, as a Conservative, want to promote nationalisation. But at the same time, it was perfectly obvious to industrialists that electricity was too expensive in Britain, and there were clearly some advantages in votes in spreading electricity further. Baldwin put a revolutionary bill before Parliament. The state would construct a national grid to connect the 122 most efficient power stations across the country. He believed only this could lower the price of electricity and modernize Britain. Nothing like it had been seen before. Many people in Britain were deeply suspicious of the electricity supply bill of um, 1926. Why was that? Well, because it seemed like a form of Soviet control of the people, socialist, awful thing. Famously in the Soviet Union, Lenin said that communism was Soviet power plus electricity. So this very idea of electricity as being part of these um, authoritarian but dynamic uh, national systems that were antithetical to the British way of life was deeply worrying to people in these islands. Order, order. Don't forget that the national grid is before Parliament in the same year as the national strike. Baldwin felt that it was urgent that Britain produced higher levels of employment and that electricity would be central to that. And, and that this would have an energizing effect throughout the whole economy. With the country on its knees, the holy grail of cheap electricity flowing across Britain was too much for Parliament to resist. The bill was finally passed, and the Central Electricity Board created to erect and run the grid. A lot of people said this is nonsense, and the biggest fear of all is it, is it would prove costly, cumbersome and unworkable. Nobody would know whether it would work or not until the thing was built. The Central Electricity Board embarked on the biggest single peacetime construction programme Britain had ever seen, and one that would take years to complete. It's interesting that Britain was capable and is still capable of doing things that are quite draconian and uh, every bit as um, statist as the Soviets would do in a spirit of sort of gentle compromise but underneath it was pretty steely stuff. 4,000 miles of transmission line and cable had to be run across Britain and it would take over a hundred thousand men to do it. Over at Cowley substation, which is just south of Oxford, it's a bit like a junction on a motorway for electricity. And we've got six lines going away from this substation, two which go across to the west, to Gloucester. We've got two that go to the east, then we've got two that run down to the Didcot power station. The main reason we have overhead lines as opposed to a lot of underground cables is overhead lines are easier to maintain and underground cable costs more per equivalent length.
Economics meant that the vast majority of the grid would be run overhead and supported by pylons. In an era before motorways, it was arguably the greatest man-made addition ever to the British landscape. Today's design is still based on the originals from the 20s. When it came to designing the national standard for pylons, well, there was obviously a serious discussion. Great studies were made of pylon design across the world. The designs across even Scandinavia, certainly in the Soviet Union, and in the States, are all, if you look at them, one after the other, pretty brutal. And in Britain it was thought, hmm, how can we make it a little bit more genteel? You know, how can we give us a nice little bowler hat, as it were? Well, what was done was that the very conservative classical architect, Sir Reginald Blomfield, was brought in. He was famous for having rebuilt the end of Regent Street. And he was very interested, though, in the idea of the pylon in the true original sense. Now, the word's Greek, and it describes a form of Egyptian gateway. And the idea of those Egyptian gateways was that they were gateways to the sun. So you get the idea of the sun, god, electricity, power. And in Blomfield's mind, he's very much thinking of that. The first of Blomfield's many pylons went up on the 14th of July, 1928, near Edinburgh. Some schoolboys even came home to witness a pylon appearing on the family farm. By this time, I was a school in Perth. I remember the squad of men, and the, the, the cables came in a huge drum, and the drum was anchored, and the horse that pulled the cable out, oh, hundreds of yards. So, yeah, it's a big event in the area. That was amazing. <laughs> but not everyone in Britain was or has ever been quite so pleased about the pylon's progress. The grid crossed through the estates of 22,000 individual landowners and the consent of each one was sought as the claims of a new Britain were pitched against the old. Even the most open-minded had their misgivings. Now here's a, a picture of the house taken from the side. That's where Granny lived. That's me. Um, and this is exactly how I remember she looked. Highly intelligent. With the Quaker tradition, she had become interested in good works and she had the countrywoman's love for the countryside she knows. There is a letter written by her to The Times in 1932 about a proposal to erect a line of pylons close to Kill and that this new idea would uh, desecrate the countryside. In those days, you know, people weren't used to seeing lines of pylons, not down there anyway. <laughs> Britain's beauty spots, like the South Downs, the Lake District and the New Forest, became sites of vociferous anti-pylon campaigns. For a country like this, the Council for the Preservation of Rural England has been fighting a battle for many years, fighting to preserve such unspoiled beauty as this, for instance, from unsightly pylons. Did the Central Electricity Board feel genuinely threatened? The archives suggest they felt very threatened. So many of the people involved in the protest movements were so eminent 
we've got John Maynard Keynes, Rudyard Kipling, Galsworthy, and what the electrical press called impractical aesthetes.